the largest hot desert in the world has a history that may surprise you. I know what you may be thinking, the Sahara Desert was once green? Well actually no, it was many times green. In this video I'm going to be talking about all the times the Sahara was green or ice covered or any other climatic changes that it underwent throughout geologic time and then I'm going to discuss how it became such a large hot desert today and what factors led to its desertification. So very early on in Earth's history, when continental land masses were just forming, we don't have a great understanding of where exactly the Sahara or even Africa was in those continental land masses because they were just kind of blobs that don't represent the continents today. However, by about 550 million years ago, right around the beginning of the Cambrian period of the Paleozoic era, we start to get a better understanding of where the modern continental land masses were within the land masses that were around at those times. For example, from around 550 to 300 million years ago, the African continental land was tied up in the Gondwana supercontinent, which in the Cambrian Ordovician and Silurian periods of the Paleozoic era, in other words, from about 550 to around 400 or 420 million years ago, Gondwana spent most of its time situated over or near the South Pole, and the land that is now Africa also spent most of its time near the South Pole, leading to a very cold climate, basically a Sahara Desert that was very different than the type of desert it is today, in other words, covered in ice sheets and glaciers glaciers rather than sand. Much of Gondwana shifted northward during the Devonian period from around 420 to 360 million years ago, leading to a warmer, more humid, forest and shallow sea covered Africa at the time. Gondwana then collided with Laurentia, another major supercontinent at the time, around 300 million years ago, which began the formation of Pangaea. Nearly all land in the Carboniferous period around this time was warm, humid, and filled with coal swamps. We've even found swamp deposits on land that would have been pretty far south on Gondwana during the Carboniferous, meaning that the climate at the time was likely really warm and humid and swampy. But the following period in the Permian brought some dryness. Increased aridity and warming during the Permian dried out much of the continental land masses as Pangaea, the supercontinent at the time, was forming, and this caused a lot of the internal land part of Pangaea to be pretty far away from water, and also this big continental land mass was kind of lifted up a little higher than normal, making, you know, less shallow seas available for life, and that contributed to the big mass extinction at the end of the Permian and all of that, and overall it really just dried out the land that is now the Sahara and it was not a great time for life, especially nearing the end of the Permian period. But when Pangaea broke up around 200 to 65 million years ago, which is a long time, but it took a long time for that supercontinent to fully break apart, but as it broke apart, the Tethys Sea between Africa and Eurasia started to widen, but then other tectonic forces eventually forced Africa and Eurasia kind of back toward each other, closing the Tethys Sea, forming instead the Mediterranean Sea around 30 million years ago. Also beginning around 30 million years ago was the rifting or the stretching tectonic forces occurring in the East African Rift System, which is still active today. Rifting is the uplifting extension and thinning of continental lithosphere, or kind of the uppermost part of Earth's mantle and crust, and this rifting is driven by mantle convection and plumes. The East African Rift in particular created a series of basins, which are now filled by a lot of lakes and rivers, which along with global climate change really played a crucial role in shaping the Sahara and its climate. The continued tectonic activity in this area as Africa drifted northward eventually closed waterways, well not completely, but almost fully closed waterways that connected the Atlantic and Mediterranean seas. And this disconnection led to an extreme drying event in the Mediterranean region, causing drastic evaporation and a lot of extinctions to the life that used to live in that region that was drying all the way up. 
It also led to something called the Mycenaean salinity crisis, because as the Mediterranean Sea was drying up and evaporating, the water that evaporates is H2O, leaving behind a lot of other constituents in the sea, because as we know, seas are saline, they have salt. And so all those salt ions like calcium, sodium, chloride, all those ions started to stay behind in the water that wasn't evaporating, and that water became lower and lower in volume, causing those ions to become more and more saturated in solution, and ion saturation in solution leads to precipitation. In other words, the formation of minerals like salts, so sodium chloride or halite, and other evaporite minerals like magnesium chloride, potassium chloride, calcium carbonates, and all of these evaporite minerals formed huge deposits around five to six million years ago when this was happening, which we now see today, and that helps us to understand what happened and when this happened. However, this drying event, although it led to a great increase in aridity in the region, wasn't the major thing that caused the Sahara that we know today to become the largest hot desert in the world. It was actually much later that that transition occurred. So what exactly caused that? Well, in addition to tectonics, Milankovitch cycles, which are just changes in Earth's orbit, its tilt, its orbit shape, its kind of wobble, these also significantly influence, well, the Sahara's climate, but also global climate over time. The reason they impact climate is because they change the amount and distribution of solar radiation received by Earth over time. And Milankovitch cycles in particular, in combination with tectonic changes like isolation of Antarctica and the formation of certain waterways like the Isthmus of Panama or the Drake Passage, triggered the modern ice age. And I have a whole video talking about how these changes triggered the modern ice age, which I'll link up here if you're interested. But here's where we get to the Sahara's recent history and what really has recently strongly controlled its green versus brown appearance. So during glacial maxima, in other words, glacial advances, cool periods during this ice age that we are in, the Sahara typically expands with the typical global increase in aridity and cooling. However, during interglacial periods, during minima, glacial minima, so the retreat of the glaciers during the warm spikes in the Ice Age, the Sahara receives more rain, and that allows more vegetation and sometimes even rivers and lakes to flow through the Sahara region. One particularly intense example of this is the current interglacial period beginning around 11,700 years ago, which triggered an event that we literally call Green Sahara, or sometimes in more technical language, the African humid episode. This event was triggered by increased summer monsoon rainfall leading to the expansion of vegetation, lakes, and rivers, which supported diverse flora and fauna, including early humans. The Green Sahara event, however, unfortunately ended around 5,000 years ago due to a global increase in aridity. However, this global increase in aridity was not caused by a glacial maxima, but instead was triggered by atmospheric and oceanic circulation changes, in addition with Earth's orbit and solar radiation Milankovitch type cycle changes. The main triggers, however, are thought to be one, the African Easterly Jet, which is a high altitude jet stream that flows eastward across Africa, transporting moisture. It's thought that it shifted north during the Green Sahara event, allowing more moisture to reach that region. And then around 5,000 years ago, it shifted back southward to its current position, driving moisture away from the Sahara. And two, the intertropical convergence zone, where trade winds from both hemispheres meet, leading to high rainfall. These shift seasonally, but it's thought that there was a general shift of both toward the north during the beginning of the Green Sahara, bringing more rainfall, and then 5,000 years ago, again shifting back south, just like the African easterly jet, and that moved rainfall away from the Sahara. In any case, as the climate in the Sahara Desert became drier and drier over the next 5,000 years ago to today, vegetation disappeared and lakes and rivers dried up. Today, the Sahara is the largest hot desert in the world and is still growing, with vast stretches of sand, rocky terrain, and extreme aridity. But despite the lack of life in the Sahara itself, this region actually maintains the most 
biodiverse place on Earth. So check out my video on how the Sahara maintains the Amazon rainforest up here. I'll link it here if it's out by now. If not, it'll be out very soon. And with that, guys, my references are linked down below as always. And I can't wait to see you guys next time. Bye.